Part two, chapter two, section one of the possessed by Fyodor Dostoevsky. He walked the length of Bogoyavlensky Street. At last the road began to go downhill. His feet slipped in the mud, and suddenly there lay open before him a wide, misty, as it were empty expanse, the river. The houses were replaced by hovels. The street was lost in a multitude of irregular little alleys. Nikolai Vsevolodovitch was a long while making his way between the fences, keeping close to the river bank, but finding his way confidently and scarcely giving it a thought indeed. He was absorbed in something quite different, and looked round with surprise when suddenly, waking up from a profound reverie, he found himself almost in the middle of one long, wet, floating bridge. There was not a soul to be seen, so that it seemed strange to him when suddenly, almost at his elbow, he heard a deferentially familiar but rather pleasant voice, with a suave intonation, such as is affected by our over-refined tradespeople or befrizzled young shop assistants. Will you kindly allow me, sir, to share your umbrella? There actually was a figure that crept under his umbrella, or tried to appear to do so. The tramp was walking beside him, almost feeling his elbow, as the soldiers say. Slackening his pace, Nikolai Vsevolodovitch bent down to look more closely, as far as he could, in the darkness. It was a short man, and seemed like an artisan who had been drinking. He was shabbily and scantily dressed. A cloth cap, soaked by the rain, and with the brim half torn off, perched on his shaggy, curly head. He looked a thin, vigorous, swarthy man with dark hair. His eyes were large and must have been black with a hard glitter and a yellow tinge in them like a gypsy's. That could be divined even in the darkness. He was about forty and was not drunk. Do you know me? asked Nikolai Vsevolodovitch. Mr. Stavrogin, Nikolai Vsevolodovitch, you were pointed out to me at the station when the train stopped last Sunday, though I had heard enough of you beforehand. From Pyotr Stepanovitch, are you Fedka, the convict? I was christened Fyodor Fyodorovitch. My mother is living to this day in these parts. She's an old woman, and grows more and more bent every day. She prays to God for me day and night, so that she doesn't waste her old age lying on the stove. You escaped from prison? I've had a change of luck. I gave up books and bells and church-going because I had a life sentence, so that I had a very long time to finish my term. What are you doing here? Well, I do what I can. My uncle, too, died last week in prison here. He was there for false coins, so I threw two dozen stones at the dogs by way of memorial. That's all I've been doing so far. Moreover, Pyotr Stepanovitch gives me hope of a passport, and a merchant's one, too, to go all over Russia, so I'm waiting on his kindness. Because, says he, my papa lost you at cards at the English club, and I, says he, find that inhumanity unjust. You might have the kindness to give me three roubles, sir, for a glass to warm myself. So you've been spying on me. I don't like that. By whose orders? As to orders, it's nothing of the sort. It's simply that I knew of your benevolence, which is known to all the world. All we get, as you know, is an armful of hay or a prod with a fork. Last Friday I filled myself as full of pie as Martin did of soap. Since then I didn't eat one day, and the day after I fasted, and on the third I'd nothing again. I've had my fill of water from the river. I'm breeding fish in my belly. So won't your honor give me something? I've a sweetheart expecting me, not far from here, but I daren't show myself to her without money. What did Pyotr Stepanovitch promise you from me? He didn't exactly promise anything, but only said that I might be of use to your honor if my luck turns out good. But how exactly he didn't explain. For Pyotr Stepanovitch wants to see if I have the patience of a Cossack and feels no sort of confidence in me. Why? Pyotr Stepanovitch is an astronomer and has learnt all God's planets, but even he may be criticized. I stand before you, sir, as before God, because I have heard so much about you. Pyotr Stepanovitch is one thing, but you, sir, maybe, are something else. When he's said of a man he's a scoundrel, he knows nothing more about him except that he's a scoundrel. Or if he's said he's a fool, then that man has no calling with him except that of fool. But I may be a fool Tuesday and Wednesday, and on Thursday wiser than he. Here now he knows about me that I'm awfully sick to get a passport, for there's no getting on in Russia without papers, so he thinks that he's snared my soul. 
i tell you sir life's a very easy business for pyotr stepanovitch for he fancies a man to be this and that and goes on as though he really was and what's more he's beastly stingy it's his notion that apart from him i daren't trouble you but i stand before you sir as before god this is the fourth night i've been waiting for your honour on this bridge to show that i can find my own way on the quiet without him i'd better bow to a boot thinks i than to a peasant's shoe and who told you that i was going to cross the bridge at night well that i alone came out by chance most through captain lebyadkin's foolishness because he can't keep anything to himself so that three roubles from your honour would pay me for the weary time i've had these three days and nights and the clothes i've had soaked i feel that too much to speak of it i'm going to the left you'll go to the right here's the end of the bridge listen fyodor i like people to understand what i say once for all i won't give you a farthing don't meet me in future on the bridge or anywhere i've no need of you and never shall have and if you don't obey i'll tie you and take you to the police march Aha! fling me something for my company anyhow i've cheered you on your way be off but do you know the way here there are all sorts of turnings i could guide you for this town is for all the world as though the devil carried it in his basket and dropped it in bits here and there i'll tie you up said nikolai vsyevolodovitch turning upon him menacingly perhaps you'll change your mind it's easy to ill-treat the helpless well i see you can rely on yourself i rely upon you sir and not very much on myself i've no need of you at all i've told you so already but i have need that's how it is i shall wait for you on the way back there's nothing for it i give you my word of honour if i meet you i'll tie you up well i'll get a belt ready for you to tie me with a lucky journey to you sir you kept the helpless snug under your umbrella for that alone i'll be grateful to you to my dying day he fell behind Nikolai Vsyevolodovitch walked on to his destination feeling disturbed. This man who had dropped from the sky was absolutely convinced that he was indispensable to him, Stavrogin, and was in insolent haste to tell him so. He was being treated unceremoniously all round. But it was possible, too, that the tramp had not been altogether lying and had tried to force his services upon him on his own initiative, without Pyotr Stepanovitch's knowledge, and that would be more curious still. End of part two, chapter two, section one.